Hello everyone, this is Anuradha Sharma and you are watching my channel Eyes with Anuradha. The test is in four part, part one, part two, part three, and part four. Now look at part one. Part one. You are going to hear a conversation between an agent and a student. First, you have some time to look at questions one to six. Now listen to the tape and answer the questions. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Do you rent apartments here? Yes, among other things. Are you looking to rent an apartment? Maybe, but I think I might actually be more interested in renting a house. Do you rent those as well? Yes, we do. Will you be renting alone? No, I have two friends that will live with me, but I'll be the primary renter. My friends don't have a source of income, which is kind of disappointing, but I do. I'm an artist and I've already sold a number of paintings. I just moved to town to try to get more of my work shown. Oh, so you'd like to be near the uptown area? That's where most of the galleries are, right? Yes, and there's a large area of homes only a couple of blocks away. Great. I don't have a car, so I prefer being within biking distance of the galleries. That would certainly be possible. Well, let me see. There's a large four-bedroom house right off Main Street. That sounds good. I'd love to have extra rooms for my paintings. How much is it per month? Around $950. Ouch! That's too much for now. Do you have anything a bit cheaper? I have a three-bedroom that's for $650. Hmm. That is definitely affordable. But I did want at least one extra room. Is there anything else with more rooms? Oh, here's another five-bedroom that's vacant right now. It's further away, about a mile from the gallery area. But they're only asking $800. That's a deal for so much space. Well, a mile isn't so bad. It's only a five-minute bike ride. And that price is OK. I'd like to see that one. Can you give me the address? Sure. It's on 1566 Honeysuckle. H-O-N-E-Y-S-U-C-K-L-E. -E, Drive. Wood Heights. Now look at questions 7 to 10. As the talk continues, answer questions 7 to 10. Mmm, such a lyrical street name. I like it. Is it furnished? Partially. It has a couch and chairs, a dining table, refrigerator and stove, a wardrobe, a couple of dresses and such, but no beds. Does it have a washer and dryer? It doesn't say here. But why don't you go and take a look? Here's a key. Just bring it back today before five. We'll do that. An hour or two later. Hi, you're back. How did you like it? A lot. But I know why it's listed so low. A couple of windows are broken and they definitely need to be fixed. I'm surprised no one has broken into the house and taken anything. That should be fixed right away. No problem. I'll get a work crew out there today. That should be fixed even if you don't rent it yourselves. Did they have a washer and dryer? No, but I can wash clothes by hand until I find good used ones. There was another thing, though. The tiles in the kitchen floor were broken and lying all over the place. You'd need to put in a new kitchen floor as well. OK. I'll talk about that with the landlord. If you can do those two things, then I'll take it as soon as you're ready. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. 
You will hear a discussion between two psychology students and their tutor. First, look at questions 11 to 14. Listen carefully. So, how did you find the lecture yesterday? Reasonably interesting, but he sort of rushed through Maslow's work, which, considering it's been covered before, is fine for everyone else except me, who missed the last lesson. Why don't you fill him in then, Tina? Me? Oh, OK. Well, basically, it's simple enough. We all have certain needs, and what Maslow did was group them into categories. Depending on how successful your life has been or what stage of life you are at, your needs change and you shift from one of Maslow's categories into another. First, there's your basic needs. Physiological needs, the professor said. Is that right? Very good. These needs are pretty obvious. They're our most basic ones. Things every human needs to survive and function, like air, water, food, clothing and shelter. It's not rocket science, this bit. Maslow just points out that until we have satisfied those basic needs, our desires don't evolve into anything more complex and we don't seek any greater form of fulfilment. Isn't that a bit irrelevant today? Not really. Millions of people in the developing world are still fighting to fulfil these needs, fighting for their very lives every day. Good point. So anyway, Maslow represented what he called his hierarchy of needs on a pyramid or, in 2D, a triangle. With physiological being at the base, presumably? Yes, it's obvious, isn't it? What's at the other end of the spectrum, then? Well, to be at the pinnacle, you've got to have mastered the other levels of need. Then you are in the self-actualization zone. This is a place where you are very at one with yourself and looking to make the absolute most of your skills, talent and potential. You can only focus on maximising these, though, of course, if, as Maslow reminds us, you're fulfilled in every other sense. And what are these in-between levels, then? Well, after you've found food and water and shelter and so on, the next step is to fulfil your safety requirements. Safety does not just mean your physical safety, though. That's far too simplistic. It's also about your emotional safety, your job security and so on. And let me guess, after that it's the need for esteem. No, Maslow reasoned that after your physiological and safety needs are fulfilled, the next most urgent requirement is for friendship, intimacy, companionship and so on. You know, on an emotional level, building a family, having relationships, etc. Only then, after you have found a sense of belonging, does the need for esteem take precedence, he argues. Presumably that's the need to feel accepted and valued. Yes, but more on that later. Do you feel more comfortable now? Yes. Thank you both. Before the broadcast continues, Look at questions 15 to 20. You will now listen to the second part of the talk. OK, now that you are both familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, let's look at a few cases in point. Case one. Uh, crime boss in the slums of Mumbai, what do you think? Surely very low. Physiological, I'd have said. But he has food and shelter. A shed is hardly shelter. And how is living from hand to mouth every day adequate from a nutritional perspective? Oh, of course. You're right if you look at it objectively, but remember that human psychology is far more complicated than that. When quizzed, this person surprised researchers. First of all, he regarded his shed as adequate shelter and was completely content there. Secondly, he genuinely felt satisfied with his level of food intake. Thirdly, being the crime boss of the slums, he felt very safe, arguing that no one would ever touch him. He had no self-esteem issues either, since he had the respect of his fellow slum dwellers. It may have been fear, but he perceived it as respect. That is all that matters, and was quite content with who he was. I see. So it's not just about the reality of your situation, but also how you perceive that reality. Exactly. 
Most people would be very low on the hierarchy in his position, feeling like they wanted and needed much more. He did not. Now, what about case two, a multi-millionaire rock star? Well, you'd naturally assume he's fulfilled his physiological and safety needs, but when you read on through his profile, look here, he's plagued by paranoia and thinks someone is trying to kill him. On that basis, given his state of mind, he must believe that his safety is compromised. So safety must be his primary concern. Very good. And look here at case three, a property magnet. Having suffered badly during the recession, his portfolio of properties is in danger of being repossessed. In fact, look, he's in danger of losing everything and being left without even enough to support himself. Wow! So I guess he's gone from very high up right down to the bottom. Exactly. Even his basic needs are no longer secure. An excellent example of how there can be movement both ways on the pyramid. Case four: a housewife. She must have some esteem issues, surely. Read on. She is quite content and well respected and loved by her friends and family. What's more, being a housewife is all she ever wanted to do, and she has excelled at the task. Therefore, forget esteem. This lady has maximised her potential in her eyes. She's right at the top. And case five, a very sad case. It is what it is. There are always innocent victims of war, and he was left with nothing—not even a home over his head. Every day is a struggle to survive. How sad. And last but not least, case six, another rock star, though a different story. He says the only thing he craves is friendship. He has everything, but is awfully lonely. I think it's obvious where he is on Maslow's hierarchy. Indeed. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will soon hear an informative talk given by Michelle on how to keep out burglars and keep your home safe. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-six. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-six. Keep them out. There's no fail-proof way to keep out a burglar, but every little bit of deterrence helps. Even if you can't afford a security system, you can take a few minutes to make your home a little safer. Some relatively simple steps will greatly decrease the odds of a break-in. Which means you can enjoy a bit more peace of mind, and isn't that what home is all about? Think like a burglar. If you were one, how would you get into your home? Evaluate your home from the inside and out, night and day. You might even try a mock break-in, trying window jams and loose locks on your house's perimeter. To keep out a burglar, the first thing to do is to secure the windows. Though windows are relatively easy to break, the loud noise of shattering glass will deter a thief if you're near other houses. Don't leave windows open during the night, whether you're at home or away. That's a common sense precaution, but a surprising number of people forget to do just that. Use a pick-proof locking device for your windows. Make sure the frames are solid. If you're beyond the earshot of your neighbours, they won't hear the glass breaking. Consider installing a plexiglass sheet for the more accessible windows. This will make entry through them more difficult. Your doors should also be secured. If you don't have a peephole, install one in the front door. If you have one, make sure that you and your family are in the habit of using it. Don't open the door to anyone you don't know, especially at night. If the peephole is out of reach of your children, keep a stepladder or stepping box by the door for them to use. 
If there's any glass within two feet of your front door lock, consider a locking device that would be out of reach if the glass is broken. Now, a few tips on how to protect your valuables. Don't leave your valuables, stereo, computer, jewellery, etc., where they can be seen from the window. If you don't want to hide everything from sight, consider blinds. Make a valuables inventory. Keep a record of your expensive and personally significant items, not just a listing, but a photographic or videotape record if possible. Store this inventory at another location. This is helpful for both the police and the insurance agency to identify the stolen goods. Use an engraving pen to mark these items with some kind of personal identifying information, such as your initials, in an inconspicuous place. This also helps record your possessions in case of any other mishap, such as fire or flood. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. Don't stop your security awareness at the outside walls of your house. Your yard areas, if any, also deserve your attention. In general, don't leave anything around the yard that might help a burglar get into your house. Ladders, stackable boxes or any garden tools should be put away, preferably in a locked cabinet. Install a light in your yard that is sensitive to movement. Place it high and out of reach. Trim hedges or bushes that are near doors or windows. These can be good hiding places. Don't place outdoor furniture tables nearby the house. These could become an easy stepladder to the roof. When you are on vacation, create the occupancy illusion. Maybe you laughed at your mother for leaving the lights on and the radio playing while she left for vacation, but she had the right idea. Those steps aren't quite enough, so try these strategies. Buy electronic timers that turn lights on and off at different times. Hook up a timer to your TV for a few hours each evening. Turn up the volume too. Not enough to annoy the neighbours, just enough that a lurker at the windowsill couldn't miss hearing it. Have your newspaper and mail delivery suspended. If you don't have time to do this, ask a neighbour to pick them up for you. Ask a neighbour to park in your driveway or parking place. Think about having someone house sit your home. If it's a relative or friend, it may cost you no more than the contents of your refrigerator. You can also find professional house sitters or house-sitting services that find someone to stay while you're away. Leave your shades as they are normally, or at least don't close up everyone. One sign of a vacant house is closed shades during the day. Lock your garage door with a padlock. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Today I'm going to talk about the city of Barcelona and its architecture. First, the city. Barcelona is a city of some one and a half million people. It is a port situated on the northeast coast of Spain in the province of Catalonia. The people speak Catalan as their native language, but most are also fluent in Castilian Spanish and some speak English too. The city centre is surrounded by a ring road which encloses a grid with two major roads running diagonally across it. These are the Avenidas Diagonal and Meridiana. Probably the most famous street in Barcelona is La Rambla, which connects the Placa de Catalunya in the town centre to the Statue of Columbus on the water's edge. All along the centre of this wide boulevard are stalls selling flowers and artistic works. Barcelona was founded by the Carthaginians from modern-day Tunisia in North Africa. It grew under the influence of the Roman Empire, later becoming the capital of Spain. Under strong government, it expanded its trade, exporting cloth to other Mediterranean ports and establishing itself as a financial centre. It went into decline after 1400, and in 1640 it was the centre of the Catalan Revolution against King Philip IV of Spain. Now it is considered by many to be the cultural centre of Spain, and the Olympic Games were held there in 1992. Now to the architecture. Throughout the city, there are many fine buildings, churches, cathedrals, markets and squares, which date back to the 13th century. One very fine square, which can be entered from La Rambla, is the Placa Real, or Royal Square. This was built by Molina in the 19th century. Seven narrow passages lead into a large central area, which is surrounded by two-storey buildings. Most of the ground floor is occupied by restaurants and bars, and it is traditionally a place of music and entertainment. It is impossible to talk about the architecture of Barcelona without mentioning Gaudi, who dominated the scene from the 1880s until his death in 1926. His style was unique, a decorative form of Art Nouveau, the style of the 1920s and 30s in Europe. It was based on organic natural forms, which often seem to defy the qualities of the materials they are made from. I will mention just three of his best-known works today. The first is Guell Palace. This was built for the Count of Guell, one of Gaudi's main supporters. The building features two arched gates which lead into the stable area. Inside are two circular staircases, one for people and the other for horses. The ground floor is built of brick, but there is also much natural stone used in the construction. The roof is quite fantastic, with brightly coloured sculptures built around the chimneys and ventilation shafts. Another project commissioned by Guell is the park named after him. This was meant to be a garden city with 50 houses, but in fact only two were ever finished. The influence of nature is strong in the cave-like spaces and animal figures, and again much use has been made of brilliantly coloured surfaces. But the greatest of Gaudi's works is still under construction, and it is not expected to be finished until 2041. He began work on this cathedral, known as La Sagrada Familia, Church of the Holy Family, in 1882, which means that it will have taken 159 years to complete. The finished building will have 18 towers, the highest being 170 metres high. The building will be 95 metres long by 60 metres wide, and it will hold 13,000 people, a truly impressive monument to Gaudi's great genius. And that's all we have time for today. Next week, we'll look at some of Gaudi's smaller projects, and also his furniture designs. Please make sure that you complete your assignment on Le Corbusier by this coming Friday. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Thank you for watching and stay tuned for more videos.